Today we are going to present uh, Connecting the Dots with Couchbase, our Equifax journey into NoSQL and in particular Couchbase. My name is uh, Jay Duraiswamy. I am uh, responsible for running uh, data platforms for US information technology. This is Keejan Lee, uh, he's architect developer. Just to give an introduction on uh, Equifax and the business of big data that we deal with, um, uh, as you know, Equifax uh, as a credit bureau, but uh, over the period of last 10 years, we have accumulated uh, many different data sources, and we have about uh, 800 uh, million plus consumer data, 90 plus uh, uh, million businesses data, and we operate on 24 different countries, and we like to think of ourselves as a financial technology or fintech company. Uh, with respect to big data, uh, even before the big data became a household name, uh, we were in big data, believe it or not. Our first foray into big data development was using a MPP software called Sizent. Uh, if anybody is familiar with it, that's basically today's open source version of a HPCC from LexisNexis and that is still in production. It's a C++-based uh, Win32 grid computing engine. Uh, we do a lot of uh, high volume, high throughput systems on the batch side of it. And uh, within my group, we have about five petabyte plus scale uh, Hadoop, Greenplum, and uh, homegrown uh, C++ grid computing engines. As we are actually more familiar on the big data side of it, mostly on the batch, we also have online systems, mostly serve attributes and models for our customers. And uh, recently there is a, uh, well actually a uh, year back, there was a, a, a use case that came in to enable uh, trended credit data online. So I'm, ass I'm assuming that every one of you, you know, uh, have a home or applied for a mortgage. When that loan goes through Fannie Mae's underwriter system, it comes to Equifax and TransUnion and Experian, and the data gets aggregated, and then your credit snapshot as of that particular day is actually scored, and that is how you actually get a FICO score and a loan and interest rate and other things. And uh, last October, Fannie has announced that they are going to enhance the credit reporting uh, using their underwriting system and display 24 months of credit history. Uh, or if you have a, you know, two homes or a couple of credit cards, having a 24 month of history helps uh, uh, underwriters to judge your risk po portfolio much better than uh, just looking at one uh, snapshot of it. So uh, the challenge that we have is uh, we have a shorter timeline, but we have about 1.5 uh, billion records, uh, kind of a, across 300 million uh, US population, and uh, we have constantly uh, getting updated. Uh, we have a mod gauge system, which is an age-old system that we need to enable the tri-bureau merging uh, uh, as part of this 24-month credit history. We also have to accommodate for updates because you could actually call Equifax and say, uh, my uh, you know, balance on the third month uh, on uh, you know, Bank of America credit card is not good. Uh, we have to take care of the disputes. So there is a live system that we have to build in terms of enabling this uh, multi-month uh, credit data so that we can actually uh, uh, deliver to our uh, online mortgage system. So basically, uh, I think, you know, I, I still remember the first conversation that I had with my team, my directs and uh, uh, developers and architects, we were in a, a conference call uh, for our online system. Uh, we were, on an average, expected five milliseconds uh, uh, transactions time, and that's our time, basically. Um, so I remember pin drop silence in the room, and uh, you know we were all batch high throughput systems, we can handle online, uh, and uh, it was basically felt like my first skydiving experience. <laughs> so you know, it was my friend's 40th birthday, we don't know what we are doing, and uh, we just went and jumped in, right? So. Big data to online experience was kind of similar, but I think you know if you're doing it for the first time, let's make sure you're doing the tandem jumping with your team. 
right? Otherwise, you might end up uh, experiencing something different. So what are our uh, requirements in terms of uh, you know, technology, right? Um, we have simple key value problem, uh, no complex queries. Uh, we have a complex object, uh, but that can be fit into the NoSQL document. But we have future business cases. This is our first journey, but we don't want to stop right there. And then we have ever-growing data. Uh, and as you can see, uh, you know, we are a multi-petabyte scale system. Coming back to online, we may not be that much, but we start up with you know terabyte plus. But if this works, we also want to tap into our batch jobs through the same system uh, if possible. Um, obviously, uh, we need to scale for multi-terabytes, and then we need to have high performance and availability because, as I said, we are a backend system serving our online mortgage system and also dispute and disclosure systems, hopefully in the future, the batch. So we need to have high availability and uh, fault tolerance is very important to us and we have to have DR capability. The system cannot go down. And the other aspect, you know, Kijan might talk about it later is, we need to have application friendly environments and uh, whether it will work with other ecosystem tools, Hadoop, Spark, and uh, other, 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 other uh, long-term uh, path towards uh, where we are going in there. So as you can see, the next steps were, uh, we had a tight SLA and uh, we had a you know, uh, June launch and because we are the back end and uh, there are two, two more front end systems, we had to deliver by Q1. Uh, so our timeline has been uh, uh, very short. And in between, when we started in Q1, uh, this is actually a wrong one, uh, it's actually Q2.15, uh, uh, when we conceptualized, uh, basically in that meeting that I was talking about, let's evaluate Redis. We had some uh, theoretical knowledge of it, and then let's evaluate Mongo. Uh, there was one other group who was using it, and then let's also look at Couchbase. Uh, and uh, we had no idea about Couchbase at the point in time. Uh, I know about Membase, uh, but uh, based on that, we said, okay, let's just look at Couchbase. And let's create also the technical support uh, as we are actually uh, evaluating the technology because this is going to be in production 24 seven, highly available. We need a partner who actually helps us uh, throughout the journey. And then uh, obviously within the timeline from uh, Q2 15, uh, by Q1-16, uh, we should be ready and uh, uh, for the end systems. So obviously the winner is Couchbase, that's why we are here. <laughs> so, uh, so I think, you know, as you can see, right, I think, you know, uh, uh, the Redis was re definitely an interesting one because uh, it is still the fastest of key value store. And uh, at that time when we were looking at it, it was uh, before 3.0, I think 3.0 was in beta. And, uh, but uh, Couch was very close to it. Uh, when we are looking at Couch versus Redis, we had to make a conscious choice around the future, as well as the other capabilities that Couch can provide over Redis, which is purely a key value database. And, uh, and then uh, Couch also uh, uh, can spill over data to a disk, I think you know. Um, you know, we have tested the performance. Uh, obviously, if you have the data in memory, it is going to be a lot faster one. But if you have it in the uh, 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 disk, it still gets a, a very reasonable performance. If some of your use cases can be on disk, and with SSD, you can actually go a lot faster. And uh, with Redis, it's all in memory. Otherwise, it's going to fail. And uh, distributed document database, Redis is not. Uh, obviously, Mongo is. Automatic replication is very much important. When you add a node, uh, when you say you want to have a 2x or 3x, uh, it replicates automatically. Uh, integrated caching, uh, it, since it is built on base, built on base of uh, uh, memcached, uh, we have a software caching, uh, unlike some of the hardware ca caching on uh, uh, Mongo. Uh, and then uh, the primary and secondary indexes, uh, Redis had a primary indexes and then uh, Couch uh, had both. Uh, I think Mongo does have primary and secondary in the recent releases. Yeah, they have that, yeah. 
and uh, spatial querying, we do have a lot of uh, uh, geo analysis, uh, geo querying that we do, not for this use case, but uh, we definitely wanted to look into that. Um, LDAP integration was very important, uh, uh, which, uh, uh, and then how we can actually uh, uh, manage through uh, administrative console. The last uh, five things were actually, uh, I would say, uh, very specific to uh, our advantage uh, uh, couch base. Master-master uh, master replication means basically, you know, everything acts as a master. So if you have a 10 node cluster, uh, you know, if master goes down, you know, the other one can be in a master right away. With, uh, with Mongo, you are a master slave. You have to bring back the slave to become a master. And some intervention has to happen. And uh, with uh, Memcache protocol that we already talked about it, and uh, with RESTful API uh, monitoring the system or operationally uh, uh, managing the system uh, is very powerful. Uh, the, uh, our operation folks likes it. With respect to nickel, I think this was actually a, a, a very interesting moment for me, SQL or no SQL, and uh, you know, I know I'm gonna use that, so uh, we wanted to uh, definitely have that as a differentiator. Uh, I think the most important thing as I was uh, going through this evaluation process is the multi-dimension scaling. I think you know uh, the ability to run certain nodes for certain services like query or indexing or data services is very powerful. Like if you're running Nickel in the same cluster, having a few nodes for a specific use case for query service is very powerful rather than trying to use every one of the node for a horizontal you know, scalability, uh, which you know, in, in a way it is good, but at the same time having the capability to you know, park certain uh, operations uh, is very powerful in my opinion. And the last one obviously also was very important to us because we have to have a DR up and running and then we have to have a live sync going on as data gets updated through dispute and disclosure process. If the data center goes down in site A, in site yes, uh, site P as primary and secondary, uh, we got to have a, a system up and running with the latest data already synced up. So XTCR is something that is uh, uh, very, very important to us. So uh, these are the reasons why we actually uh, went to uh, Couchbase. Uh, this is our uh, architecture. Uh, we had a homegrown uh, uh, system prior to that. Uh, it was a read-only uh, C++ based system. Uh, we called it NoSQL uh, or No sorry, No DB, uh, and uh, we renamed uh, our uh, uh, system uh, base of our couch, couch base called New DB. And uh, so, as you can see, the architecture-wise, um, we have our uh, uh, mainframe on the on the left where we get, uh, it's actually daily snapshot of credit, uh, monthly is wrong one, that does come to our uh, batch system, which is a Hadoop-based system, where we actually apply our complex time series account linking algorithms. And uh, we basically take this uh, um, uh, three billion times uh, 24 months uh, data and then go through a waterfall process to link them through so that we can actually have a, a billion and a half accounts have 24 month uh, time series data. And then finally, that gets pushed into uh, Couchbase uh, for uh, serving the data online. And the middle layer uh, is what we built uh, uh, as a, as a uh, interface layer to our uh, mainframe system, which mortgage systems actually talk to get the document. And uh, as you can see, it's a HTTP API. Uh, we clearly separated the uh, couch base like any other uh, uh, you know, entire architecture where we wanted to keep the database out of it. And then uh, uh, we deployed in our Tomcat uh, as, a, as, a, uh, as a web layer. And uh, the DR is on our uh, uh, another data center uh, with a, a, a live sync going on. So now Kijan is going to talk about uh, you know some of the development and deployment and the and the lessons learned. Yeah. All right. Hello. Um, my name is Kijan Lee. Um, I'm an application developer. Um, I'm working on JC team. Um, Last year, we took a, uh, one of the challenging projects. Um, we had to evaluate the database. Also, we have to um, implement a solution based off of the database. 
So if you look at the slides, um, there are four key areas in terms of design. The first one is a storage format. It was really important. The earlier uh, old system was using our own proprietary format. Uh, we're trying to get away from it. And second one is interface. We're trying to provide a, a um, HTTP type of transaction because that's kind of uh, in the trend. Um, so all the transaction will go through HTTP. And the uh, third one is, uh, how are you going to redeploy? What kind of app container server are we going to use? There was a third um, design idea, also data ingestion. Um, as we do the design, our goal was make the library system available 24 by 7. So as you see uh, from the previous slides, we have a library system. We moving the data from the library system. Also, we get the data from the batch. We update our library system. And then while we're doing that, we should not uh, impact live product system. That was a most challenging requirement. Uh, let me go over the storage format. Um, data itself is a pipe delimiter format. That was our internal format. But we put that into JSON format. Earlier, we're using our own format. It's kind of binary container type of stuff. But in this case, we have a JSON. We put that our own data format, which is a pipe delimiter, we put in there. Also, we added metadata, like a type of a transaction and update timestamp kind of stuff into uh, JSON documents. So when you look at the JSON documents, we have metadata, also one tag, one tag contains our actual contents of the data. Um, because our data is, is using delimiters, we, we was using pipe delimiters, so it's a compression friendly. So I'm going to go over that, what's the benefit of that compression in the later slides. The second was JSON base HTTP post. That was our interface make, uh, we made available to the, the uh, mainframe system, and we supported get, retrieve, update, add. So there's a four distinct transaction. The mainframe system pick one of the transactions. It was communicating through the library system. Also in the back end, there was a couch base, which is supposed similar fashion. Um, also, we, um, when you look at the request, it's a JSON based. But as you know, these days, like a lot of web service is uh, um, based in JSON. But as a developer, you don't really have to deal with the JSON. Once you get the uh, request, it was like um, converted to Java. We used a Spring framework for that. So um, we didn't have to really deal with any JSON level syntax checking, that kind of stuff. The third one was there are a few, a few couple of options. But we picked a Tomcat because our ops operation team familiar with the Tomcat. Also, it's open source. And there's a lot of documents and a lot of people familiar with it. Also, we are familiar with it. It was a good choice. And the performance-wise, it was a very lightweight. So that's why we picked it. And the installation-wise, it was a pretty straightforward. You create a WAV file. You drop in into the um, app directory, and it's ready to go. Um, DAO, um, um, as Jay previously um, showed on the slides, earlier, we didn't know what database we're going to use. So we are looking at Redis. And we're looking at Couchbase. We are MongoDB. So um, we are um, trying to um, get ready for other product, if possible. So we decouple our DAO from the actual um, database. So data ingestion, we're trying to make it um, 24 by 7, already available. So also challenge is how is you going to move the data from the uh, batch system? So I'm going to. All the development, by the way, was done in Java. So this is our deployment system. The, the cluster hardware configuration, we had a node. Uh, we uh, consider uh, 2x replication. So total uh, memory size was 4 terabytes. It was um, based on the initial size, it was a plenty. And app server, we have a Tomcat. We installed in a two Linux servers. It, it, we designed to be kind of uh, designed for the failover. There was a, we installed the F5 the virtual IP. So whenever a request comes in, it does a round robin. So ingestion, 
we have a monthly ex ex import and export is scheduled through the scheduler. Uh, monitoring wise, our ops team create a transaction on a regular interval and they collect the result, uh, make sure that this service haul from the interface to the database, make sure these are up and running. Sampling, we also extract uh, data from the system. We move it to our UA, uh, UAT system and the QA staff look at the data, verify that there is no issue with the data. So it's a kind of ongoing, ongoing uh, process. Digital recovery is XDCL. Initially, we thought that we're going to write some DR type of stuff with the couch base. Um, we didn't really need that. So um, uh, as you know, as Jay explained, um, we, are, we are new to couch base. And, and then finally, we adopted the couch base as a main database. So this is uh, three key areas we learned uh, while we're doing the development. Data compression. In general, you guys know that um, compression helps with I.O., file I.O., also network uh, I.O. But we cannot really quantify the really benefit of compression. So um, this compression I didn't come in until middle of the project. And then we started evaluating compression. The, the reason for the compression was a, we trying to maximize the throughput uh, to the couch base. So we did a compression because our data is a, a compression friendly. We are able to save 70%. But it depends on the use case. If you just use a JSON only, you may not accomplish this one. Um, so the, the reason for a better throughput is we reduce the I.O. in the network. Also, when you read a file from the file system, you also reduce the file I.O. So we are able to cut the um, import process um, time in half or better. So also, if you look at the Rx Java, it's a reactive Java, is developed by um, Netflix, and then now it's open source. Um, earlier, we're trying to use a head-based tool, as it's a, it's called the CouchDoop. It's very good in terms of throughput, but our import process is very complicated and sophisticated. So we couldn't, uh, that the tool, even though it show us a very good throughput, it couldn't uh, meet our need. So we evaluating our own way of doing that import. And then we found a bulk import in Couchbase. And then also there is a new API which support asynchronous um, in Rx Java, um, using Rx Java library. So we researched that and also we kind of learned about it. And then if, if you have any um, um, question about this tool, you can search that like Rx Java or Reactive. So this one is um, this library using a multi-threading to increase the uh, throughput. So earlier, the, the, the challenge is um, whenever we have a data from the mainframe and we have to export. When we export the data, um, we have to look at some timestamp because the system sends a transaction over and over. So when you apply to the batch system, you got to have some cutoff time. And you send all the data based on the cutoff time. It was an export process. It was a much easier to import and send it to a batch system. And we getting the data back. So whenever we apply the data back to our original library system, the challenge is um, how you going to make sure we don't override updates that came after our cut of time. So um, we cannot simply get the data from batch and then write over, override it. So we have to look at um, whatever data from the batch system kind of walk through to see if the updated time is really, it can be overriding. So the challenge is like read all the file, read all, all the like data, also based on the um, update time, we just override it. So we did it for the 300 million. Here is like a stats. We using four Java process, and then it took 30 minutes. And only also we are um, considering using uh, Kafka as an asynchronous queue because we didn't want to put any load on the library system. But the challenge is that updates are coming in over and over, and we're going to queue them into the Kafka. And then since we know the time stamp is a cut off time, we have to find the latest transaction. So there's another extra step. So um, there's a little bit 
kind of, uh, even though Kafka provides really good performance in our use case, it was like some um, extra step. So we started looking at the couch-based couch view. Couch-based view, as you guys already know, is very good to, very good, uh, to identify a certain transaction in the bucket. And then your uh, Java program can start using the view, start using view, and then fetch the data, and then utilize it. So culture-based view always keep the latest snapshot. It doesn't really keep the um, history of the updates. So we didn't have to really find the latest transaction. Also, view was very useful because our operation team, I mean, it requires some a very, very minimum amount of uh, JavaScript um, coding. But you, these days, ops team are DevOps. So they're using the view to verify what kind of issue with the data, or they can write us some reports and things like that. Um, so we kind of go into view direction. And also, we, I want to mention that Couchbase console is very good. It's integrated into the system. And they can use the, like, you know, uh, they can check the health of the system. Also, like, how many days are in memory? Was like a cache hit ratio? They can do various kinds of activities uh, through the console. So this is a, uh, three key areas while we're doing the development. Uh, Jay, you want to go? Yeah. Can, you, uh, can you hold on to the question, please? Uh, yeah. uh, OK, OK. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So I think uh, uh, on the, once we actually you know, uh, ready for production, we also wanted to make sure that the stress testing is done very well. And uh, this is our uh, test uh, results there. Uh, we actually had a, a eight uh, node, uh, two threads per node, uh, 15 hours of continuous uh, transactions. Uh, and uh, you can see the 115 million transactions over uh, uh, you know, 15 hours. And uh, the only failure we noticed was if we didn't accommodate for the log growing forever. And uh, that was the failure that we saw. And uh, we stopped the performance testing after that. And average transaction time is 60 milliseconds. And on average, we saw, I think, 98 to 99% of the transaction on our system was uh, under 5 milliseconds. And uh, there were some uh, uh, oddities, but I think uh, it was a pretty good number. And uh, uh, this is basically from a current uh, uh, performance needs. We can actually support uh, 21 100 operations transactions uh, or transactions per second uh, in debug mode. And uh, you know there is a pillow point testing tool which actually runs within the cluster. Uh, we could actually uh, take it to uh, 1.6 million transactions. So we feel pretty good about uh, the system that we deployed and uh, as, a, as, a, as a whole. And uh, these are actually uh, uh, sample stats from uh, our production system. And as you can see, um, we have a, a million plus transactions. Uh, uh, coming in, and we are expecting to see uh, more volume going through the system. And uh, the average transaction is uh, pretty much uh, uh, very consistent, under 500, 500 milliseconds. And uh, so when I talked about in the beginning, uh, basically, uh, uh, um, there was an earlier uh, news, Fannie Mae uh, uh, announcing uh, uh, their intent to use Equifax standard data in the underwriting system. Uh, it was in October press release. And then uh, um, in September 26, uh, this year, um, uh, it's actually an announcement that came that Fannie Mae is using the, the trended data. So if you are, if you are actually uh, uh, looking at the, the, the business advantage of the trended data, when you are looking at your credit report over a period of 24 months, you may be paying more than you know, minimum amount. So your risk profile is actually completely different than when somebody is looking at your credit snapshot at a particular point in time. So your FICO score could be the same, but two, two people uh, who are paying, you know, uh, you know, one person paying minimum payment, other person paying you know, uh, more than the minimum payment could exhibit completely a, a different uh, a risks, uh, you know, characteristics going forward. Obviously, the scores and other things have to be updated, but those things are, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming soon type of features. But the idea that, you know, able to forgive a delinquency when you are looking over a period of time, your risk profile is actually a lot more, uh, uh, 
you know, manageable versus looking at a one uh, fault on your credit data uh, is uh, very, very important to uh, Equifax and also the consumers. And, uh, and that's what we have as a presentation. Uh, I know it's before lunchtime, so uh, <laughs> any questions? <laughs> Yes, please. Could you go back to the compression, please? Oh, yes. Okay. So do you use the compression do you, uh, while you're doing the, the import, or you do the compression to the entire transaction process? Um, uh, our goal was a reduce the disruption to the system. So uh, one way is you can compress on the fly, but that means because of compression, if you do it, uh, the input file, the input file probably is uh, um, we are 1.2 terabytes. So if we do the like on the fly compression, probably our process will take longer. So we adopted a pre-compression process. So we get the 1.2 file and the we uh, convert that into the compressed file and we start doing the import. So actual data size we use for the import is about a uh, little less than 200 gigabytes. Yeah, it's 1.2 terabytes that actually came yeah. down to 300 uh, yeah, gigabytes, right? Yes. So, uh, yes. Sorry? Can you? No, we are not using uh, during the transactions time. Yeah. It is yeah. a, it's a during the import time and also data addressed. Yeah. So if you're actually dealing with high throughput system, the ability to read faster yeah. is very important. Uh, because uh, as Kijan said, we, we want to actually update the data a lot faster without disrupting the system. And that's, that's basically what yeah. we are trying to do. It's 10 gig network, yes. 10 gig interconnect cluster. Uh, I'm just curious, what kind of uh, technology stack do you have for your big data analytics? Because yeah, you, know, you mentioned the coach base, you know, a little bit about the data ingestion. And do you have any sort of further plan to speed up your data ingestion pipeline? Um, within Couchbase? Or in, in you, you no, 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 nothing to do with uh, Couchbase. My, my, my question is two parts. First part is what kind of technology stack, the core of your technology stack you have for your big data analytics pipeline? And the, the, the other part is, uh, do you have any further plan to further speed up your data ingestion part of that? Okay, mm -hmm. uh, so the first part actually, um, our, our big data uh, landscape, we, like I said, we have our own uh, grid computing engine built on top of uh, C++, and uh, I'm actually in the process of uh, uh, consuming that engine inside Hadoop. Uh, I think you know we have a uh, uh, good engineering that is going on to uh, consume all the C++ code base within Hadoop, and uh, we use Kafka uh, to do some external processing, and then uh, we also push it to either it is uh, HBase or NoSQL, like Couchbase, to do some uh, uh, interactive queries. Uh, there is a fulfillment platform where uh, we do push the data to Greenplum, which is a lot more SQL friendly compared to High SQL. And uh, there also we see a Couchbase play or a NoSQL play, because right now we are actually opening up that to software as a service type play to our customers, so when they log in, uh, they want to do some uh, uh, counts and uh, interactive uh, activities, so that's that's basically where we are going as a as a as a company or as a roadmap. Uh, the other question is ingestion point of view. I think uh, uh, the batch side of it, uh, the the batch to online type. Uh, we are trying to be lambda, but not really much because our our upstream systems are still mainframe. But we are trying to put uh, Kafka in the middle. Uh, abstracting you know whether i'm getting the data once a day or uh, you know as the data gets processed in uh, uh, mainframe in the uh, midnight uh, but we, that's a journey that we have started we have, we have not gotten there yet but the ingestion into 
you know, uh, Hadoop uh, is pretty much we are matured into it, and we have tools to tools, homegrown tools to uh, uh, run through uh, various templates and land different data sources in our uh, D three hundred and sixty platform. Uh, on the online side of it, I will let uh, yeah, Kijan answer yeah. uh, uh, what um, we can do. I think uh, if you look at the slides, we use the four Java process. Um, the reason, I mean, we could use a more than four Java process. Um, the problem is our cluster has a limited resource. Um, if you look at the performance of metrics, it was a 500 kilo, 500,000 ops to 1.6 um, ops. But we uh, have to find a balance because we have to allocate some of the resource to the library system. So if, if we only focus on the ingestion side, we can um, deploy more Java process and then we can use the file I.O. and then we can push the more couch-based operations. But um, that's going to impact the library system. So four is, because our goal is trying to ingest the data within an hour. It met our requirements at the, at the same time. This one doesn't disrupt the library system. That's why we went with four. So if you use more, you can create a lot more couch-based uh, apps. That way you can make it faster. Actually, we did some testing. We used two. It took like about 50 minutes, and the four is 30 minutes, and we used also eight. Um, I think it was like um, uh, 10, between 10 and 20 minutes. I don't really remember right now. So, so, you, are, so you are using single cluster to handle in handling both online and offline systems? It's like a multi-tenancy? Uh, it's not really multi-tenancy. It's one data set. But is it like a single, single cluster handling both? Yes, handles. yes. Is it like one data source? Uh, it's not uh, technically it's not really multi-tenancy, but it can. We can have the data from the uh, batch system, also online system. They are hitting at the same time. Yeah. So you have hot data, cold data, and warm data. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Any other questions? Did you guys consider Cassandra at all in your evaluation, or not because of JSON? Or uh, I think uh, um, Cassandra, as as I, I know, I mean, I, I took the also like uh, some um, small presentation. Cassandra is more like a tab, um, table based, like a, a NoSQL database. Um, probably, um, if you have a lot of like a data warehousing kind of stuff, probably is a really good fit. And even performance-wise, Cassandra is really good. Um, the reason we pick uh, Couchbase because we like that managed cache. So when you retrieve the data, um, your data retrieval speed is very consistent. Most of the time, is less than a millisecond. Um, also, you can uh, size of your cache in an explicit way based on the hardware configuration. So in terms of a uh, document format, both of them are no SQL. Um, in our case, um, Couchbase was a better fit. Um, and uh, we always update at the document level, not at the, um, not like appending. we more like replacing the um, entire documents. So it was a really good use case. I mean, the Couchbase was a good fit. Yeah, I think I don't just, know, yeah, just just to add on to it, right? Yeah. I think uh, we were looking for a document database and a key value store that are actually going to serve our current and future use cases. Yeah. Cassandra with CFS and uh, with the limited SQL cap capabilities, it did not really even play a big role there. But uh, suddenly, you know, uh, that's something that we are we have in our head to uh, POC it. In fact, we were talking yeah. about it earlier. Yeah. So. Okay, so um, how often do you update your model? So this one is actually uh, so this is actually a pure data play. Uh, the batch system is actually building the complex linking of how to tie your uh, last month certain credit card with uh, our history, right? And then this couch base is actually serving as an online system. So. The models, when you talk about, like, you know, you're talking about like a FICO score, when it will get updated. FICO score is actually uh, owned by another company called FICO, and uh, I'm assuming that uh, they will look into updating the model uh, to reflect the trended data at some point in time. We have our own internal models built using the trended data, 
we actually expose to our customers who are basically banks and they actually build attributes using trended data and they can also build models and get deployed in what, are, what we call online model server. So it's not just the FICO models that we, we have here about 400 plus models that is deployed online. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't prevent a customer coming into our systems, access the trended data, build attributes and build a model and then deploy in an online system and then they can uh, look at your risk portfolio. It's, 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 it's a case by case, but I think you know most commonly known uh, FICO is actually uh, it's not we own it. Uh, none of our, none of the credit bureau owns it. It is a company called FICO, uh, Fair Isaac. Uh, they have updated the model, and I'm sure they they have plans. Yeah. Any question? There is one here. Sorry, I can't see. <laughs> like this. Uh, you mentioned the DAO layer earlier that you guys created that. So, um, what what drove you to do that, and what what happens if it's not available? So the the DAO layer, right? One of my ask to the team is that uh, you know I'm a separation of concerns. I come from a, a development and architecture background. Uh, uh, so, we originally built DAOs for Redis as well as Couch, and then as we actually uh, went further in the uh, analysis in the POCs, we felt more and more like Couch was the right solution. Uh, so I think I don't know, Redis DAO is probably still there, but not yeah. really. Yeah, the we're full not using it. Yeah. Not using it, right? Yeah. So I think that, that basically a separation of concerns, purely a design uh, choice. Like uh, tomorrow, if I have to plug in. Uh, you know, some other database I should be able to plug in. So I think uh, DAO, it has an interface and uh, implementation is a spring bin. So you can auto wire, uh, but now we are only using Couchbase, right? All right, All right so if there are no further questions, thank you for attending the session.